So welcome everybody to our second talk in our new uh, potentially annual speaker series. Um, this is our, our delayed uh, symposium from back in March we had canceled due to COVID, but we had to you know, switch to online, which seems to be working out quite well, letting people join in literally from around the world at their own time. And we're recording these talks to show on YouTube later. So if you miss any of these different presentations, uh, tune into YouTube, our YouTube channel to watch them. As I say, this is the second talk of six. So if you'd like to sign up for the other talks in advance, you'll get a reminder email about 12 hours and two hours beforehand, because sometimes we're all busy, we forget about things. So um, signing up gives you access to the Zoom link to watch it live, as well as these reminders. So check out our website, uh, pollinationgolf.ca slash upcoming hyphen events to get the registration links. Let me get to the next slide. My computer doesn't want to go to the next slide. There we go. As I mentioned, our talks will be available on our YouTube channel coming up. A big thank you to all our sponsors. They've been very patient with us, both with the original symposium we had to cancel and now with our speaker series. So if you're able to support our sponsors or give them recognition, we highly encourage that. And again, a big thank you to all the sponsors. I also want to acknowledge that we are on Indigenous territory, that myself as a sort of European descendant, um, we are, you know, guests on this land. And so Polish and Guelph has created this land acknowledgement statement that states that Guelph is on the traditional territory of the Attawandaran and neutral people. We honor the original ancestors of this land and also offer respect to Haudenosaunee, Ashinaabe, Mississauga, and Métis neighbors. We strive to be accountable by acknowledging this history and cultivating respect and relationships with our indigenous neighbors and the land. So many of you, I see, are not tuning in from Guelph or from the UK and across Canada, the United States. So please consider the area that you are currently living in and your relationship with the land and the peoples who are here now, who have been there here, here historically. So I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Murray McFarland, uh, grew up in Scotland, so hence an international connection there as well. She obtained her honours ecology degree from the University of Stirling, and then a PhD in ecology from the University of Exeter in Cornwall. She moved to Ontario in 2006 and joined the Nature Conservancy of Canada in March 2008. She spent six and a half years as a conservation biologist for the southwestern Ontario subregion, where she designed, implemented, and managed field skill restoration of wetlands, meadows, meadows and forests. She became the Director of Science and Stewardship for Ontario in September 2014 and currently oversees stewardship work throughout Ontario. She's been managing non-native invasive species and conducting field scale restoration work throughout southwestern Ontario, both with NCC and as a volunteer at the um, Thames Talbot Land Trust. So very, very knowledgeable, very experienced. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. Uh, just a reminder again to please remain muted and leave your video off. If you have questions as we go through the presentations, please add them to the chat box. And we'll monitor that and then pose them back to Mari at the very end. So we're, we estimate about an hour in total for this webinar. Uh, about the first 40, 45 minutes will be a presentation by Mari. And then again, we'll turn into the you know, question and answer period. Um, hopefully this is coming through because my internet connection is unstable. Um, but hopefully this is when we record it for YouTube later. So if anything cuts out, we can watch it later on, on YouTube. And again, don't forget to sign up for the next talk in our speaker series at pollinationguelph.ca slash upcoming events. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mari. Uh, Mari, can you start your screen sharing? And then we will um, go from there. Uh, so Mari, yes, if you wanna jump on with your screen sharing. Great, how is that looking? That looks good, thank you. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks for the introduction and um, thank you all of you from, for signing in all over the place and lots of different time zones to, to hear a little bit about um, pollinators and climate change and some of the cool things that we're doing at the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, so as you've already heard, I've been with the Nature Conservancy of Canada for over a decade and um, it's been a cool opportunity to do lots of really neat conservation work, practical on the ground, tangible conservation work for all sorts of species at risk, common species and birds, plants, mammals, but also pollinators and, and other insects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our work and a little bit about the things that you can do in your own homes and gardens if you choose to do so, if you want to kind of get a piece of the satisfaction that I've had being able to do this at scale. So um, I'm going to jump in, hopefully. 
There we go. So I'm going to start at a pretty basic level. I know some of this will be um, old hat for many of you and might be new for some of you. It's always worth thinking back to basics. So I'm going to start with thinking about what a pollinator actually is. So plants make flowers in order to rep reproduce. They produce flowers um, in order to attract, uh, or, or in order to produce pollen, which needs to be moved from different flowers, between different flowers. And that then allows a seed to develop and a, a ideally a new plant to be established. So really this, this fundamental problem of moving pollen between different flowers and different individual plants is really where, what we're looking at today. Now it can be moved in different ways. Um, sometimes it's moved by the wind or the water. So that's often the case for many of our grasses and many um, conifer trees as well. So like this um, little pine tree up on um, Thunder Bay a couple of summers ago, it was distributing its pollen far and wide with the wind. And actually the, the water in the lake can turn yellow with the amount of pollen that's floating around at certain times of the year. So that's the stuff that makes you sneeze. That's the stuff that, that makes you sneeze and often in spring, often at other points throughout the summer, just depending on whether there's some kind of plant that's quite prevalent on the landscape that's, that is wind pollinated. These pollen grains are really small and really mobile, lightweight, often quite smooth and round. Um, and that it's very easy to install them up your nostrils and cause you to sneeze. So that's not what we're going to talk about today. Um, what we're going to talk about today is the, the plants that require some kind of animal to move the pollen around. So lots of animals are involved with pollination across the world. Some parts of the world, bats are very important in pollination, for example. Other small mammals, um, you know, even mice and voles and things can be involved in some cases. Some birds, like our hummingbirds here in Ontario, we have one species of hummingbird, the ruby-throated hummingbird, which probably has a bit of a role to play in pollination. Um, but the thing that tends to come to mind most often when you're talking about an animal pollinator is insects and, and most often bees. And the thing to remember, and I'll come back to this a few times, is that plants that require an animal to move their pollen around often produce big, showy, sometimes smelly flowers. So you can often tell at a glance if a plant is likely to cause you to sneeze or not just by looking at it. If it's got big, smelly, spectacular flowers, then the chances are it's not making pollen that's going to float up your nose very easily. It's probably making pollen that's designed to stick onto a bee or a mammal or a bird like these. So these are unlikely to make you sneeze unless you try really hard. So you've probably heard a lot in the media these days about pollinators, about bees, about um, challenges ar around these animals. So the, the thing to bear in mind is that you think bees maybe aren't very, very useful to you or, or not very exciting apart from the honey that they make, but actually so much of our um, natural world around us is dependent on insect pollinators. So in, in the wild, many wildflowers go on to produce seeds or fruit, which are really important for all sorts of animals. So birds and mammals ranging from tiny little voles and mice right up to bears actually are reliant at some point in, the, in their life cycle on some of the resulting seeds and fruits that are produced as a result of pollinators. pollinators. And also ourselves, our own food, um, for example, in the US, around 100 crops are dependent on some kind of pollinator animal. And this is worth billions of dollars annually, um, over a billion dollars in Canada. These numbers are a little bit old now, but the, the, the point being that this stuff is actually really important to the food that you eat every day. So there's a, there's a good chance that the breakfast that you ate this morning is somewhat dependent on some kind of pollinator. Now, the problem is that we've probably been hearing in the media that, that many, um, many of these pollinators are declining. And a lot of the media is centered around honeybees. And that, that is obviously a problem in itself. Honeybees are really important in, in pollinating many of our crops. They're also really important in producing honey, which you know many of you will agree is delicious. Um, however, it's worth remembering that that's not necessarily the actual conservation issue that many conservation organizations around the world are concerned about. In North America, honeybees are actually a domestic introduced animal. They're not part of our natural world here. Um, and although managed colonies have suffer suffered really serious declines, and that's obviously a, a problem, um, that's not really the conservation issue that we're, we're necessarily focusing on. The problem is that native wild bees are also declining rapidly. 
Now, it's worth bearing in mind there's around 4,000 species of bee in North America, um, just over 400 here in Ontario, where I am. Um, and these are the ones that are also declining, in some cases, quite precipitously and causing some problems, um, both in the natural world, but also with our food crops. Um, although honeybee, the domestic honeybees are really important in pollinating crops, wild bees actually make up a large proportion of that pollination service as well. So these declines in the, in the, the wild pollinators are, are really problematic. I will pause to mention here that it's not actually just bees. Um, whenever we talk about pollinators, we immediately think about bees, but actually things like this really beautiful blowfly on the right hand side of the screen are actually really important pollinators. Um, so flies, beetles, some butterflies are also important in pollination. Um, an example of this is the, the pawpaw tree. This is a fairly rare tree that occurs in southwestern Ontario. And if you look online about how to get it to produce the rather delicious fruit that people like to, to harvest, then one strategy is actually to hang roadkill, roadkilled animals in the tree in order to attract blowflies, which will then pollinate these flowers that which will then produce the really delicious fruit that you want to eat. So you may want to try that in your garden, you may not, um, but just putting that out there that, it, that this pollination thing is not just about bees. Um, so even beyond thinking about, you know, all the fruit that the bears like to eat this time of year and the, the pretty butterflies that we like to see, um, widespread insect declines in general are also being linked to massive declines in insectivorous birds. So common things or things that used to be common like barn swallows and chimney swifts and many of these, these species here in North America and similarly in Europe are declining rapidly in part probably because of a decline in insects and some of which include pollinators. So why is that? Um, the answer is as usual fairly complicated. There's a lot of things going on. Um, but here's just a few things that are going on. Widespread use of pesticides on especially agricultural land, probably some climate change happening and loss of habitat as well. So insects are like any other animal. They need food, they need shelter, they need somewhere to lay their eggs and they need somewhere to spend the winter, whether that's as an egg or as a larva or in some cases as, as an adult insect, they, they need somewhere to hang out for the winter. And, here in Ontario, as you know, winters can be pretty harsh, so that habitat's really important. But of course, what we see in large parts of especially southern Ontario is large amounts of, of land that's no longer suitable habitat, is no longer providing some or all of these things to our insects. So just going to zoom out a little bit again to give a quick quick reminder about what, what we mean by the word habitat. So this will be really boring for many of you that are, are working in this field, but it's worth zooming out and just reminding ourselves. So everything that lives needs somewhere to live. So it's, they've evolved to need very specific things in some cases, and that's what we, how we use the word habitat to describe those specific things. And some animals are, are pretty generalist. Um, they can get by in all sorts of habitats. Like this American robin here was nesting in a traffic light here in London, Ontario, where I live this spring. So they're not terribly fussy. You'll see them in your garden. You'll see them in the deep forest. You'll see them you know, just about on the beach. You'll see them, as in this case, in, in the city. Um, whereas other species need very, very specific things or a lot more fussy. So thinking again about birds, pileated woodpeckers, a great big black woodpecker. They tend to need much bigger tracts of forest and are a little bit more fussy about where they will where they will nest and where they can raise their young. And the same is really true of insects as well. Some, anim some insects can only eat one species of plant or can only visit one type of flower. So again, here in North America, the, the relationship between monarch butterflies and milkweeds is, is quite well known. Um, although the adult monarch can drink nectar from lots of different flowers, from all sorts of different species of plant, they can only lay their eggs successfully on milkweed plant. plant. Um, and again, thinking about it timing-wise, some insects are only active in May, others maybe in July, others in August. Think about the times of year um, when you're most likely to get bitten by black flies is very different from the time when you're most likely to get bitten by deer flies in Ontario. And the same is true for, for many pollinating insects as well. They may only be active for a few days or a few weeks of the year. So I'm just going to illustrate what I'm rabbiting on about. Um, this is a photo I took in a forest in London, a, a nice little natural area on the Thames River. 
And the actual names of these plants don't really matter, but the point is it's very diverse. So all of the labels on the bottom are the, the herbaceous plants that grow in the forest understory. And there's lots and lots of different species there. There's species that flower really early in, in late March, early April here in southwestern Ontario. Some of them are white, some of them are pink, some of them are yellow, some of them flower you know, not until May, June, others like the zigzag goldenrod will be flowering in, in late September into October even. And again, if you look at the trees, lots of different species of tree all doing slightly different things at slightly different times of the year. This is a really great place to be if you're any kind of insect and especially if you're a pollinator, because the chances are that if you're a real um, generalist, you'll find something at any month in the year to eat and somewhere to hang out and hide. If you're, if you're a specialist and you only you can only feed on one species of plant, then there's a good chance you'll find that in here because there's so many different species just in a small area. Now, the problem is on the other side of the trail, it looks like this. Now, this is non -native, a non-native plant called Lily of the Valley, which many of you may have growing in your gardens. Um, it's not native. So most of our animals haven't evolved to know what to do with this plant. Um, some of the, the generalist bees will be able to manage to, to get in there and, and you know pollinate the flowers and drink some nectar and, and do, lead their lives. But most other insects are not able to do anything with this. So if you're a, you know, a, a very fussy child that you might have in your family, or you, know, you just don't like certain kinds of food, then if you show up on the, the photo on the right with the lily of the valley, then you're probably, there's a high probability you're going to go hungry. You're not going to get big and, big and fat. You're not going to be able to lay eggs. You're going to die before you can reproduce. Whereas if you f turn up in the forest on the left, then you're probably in luck. So this is kind of what many conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy of Canada are, are aiming for. Is the picture on the left, not the one on the right. Um, just a quick word about climate change as well. Um, of course, all of these things are linked together. But climate change is probably leading to the timing of lots of things being different. So some fruiting trees, for example, are responding to temperature rather than to day length. So they may start to flower a bit earlier in the spring if we get a really warm spring, for example. Whereas other plants are really rigid, they will only flower at a certain time of year based on day length. And the problem arises when the insects that are required to pollinate these things are are not changing at the same rate, or they may be inflexible. They may not be able to respond to changes in timing of flowering. So you can end up with your plant saying, hey, it's warm in spring. and I'm going to make my nice flowers now. But then the bees are all still asleep because they're like, no, don't be silly. It's still April. It's, it's dangerous for me to be out in April because I might freeze to death. So these changes in the relative timing of things are, are causing some big, big disruptions in, in our natural world, and especially in our, our pollinator fauna. Um, and of course, climate change can also exacerbate the spread of non-native invasive species like the lily of the valley on the previous slide. There's many other plants like that that have made their way into our natural forests, um, into our wetlands, into our grasslands. And with changes in, in moisture regimes and changes in temperature regimes, they're able to spread really quite rapidly in some cases, which can be really bad news for those specialist pollinators and other insects. So I'm just going to pause here briefly, um, change tack a little bit, and tell you a little bit about what I'm up to at the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So we're Canada's leading land conservation charity. Um, so that means that we acquire either through the purchase or donation of land generally, which pr provides significant habitat for wildlife. So we're looking for properties that, that are supporting, for example, nice intact forests, wetlands, grasslands. Um, and in some cases, properties that provide us with the opportunity to restore habitat to make more habitat like that adjacent to existing significant areas. Um, we're a non-government organization, we're a charity, so we're dependent on funding um, from, from our many generous donors, many partners, um, and also our, um, we'd receive government support. Um, and since 1962, we've, we've managed to protect over 14 million hectares of land across Canada. So that's probably some astronomical number of football pitches. I, I didn't take the time to look that up, sorry. Um, but it's a large amount of land that we, we have helped conserve in partnership with many organizations and our many generous donors. 
So that's a little, this is a map showing roughly what that looks like across the country, all these yellow blobs are properties that we've helped conserve one way or another. Um, you'll see there's a fairly large concentration of them along the, the southern Canadian border and a lot here in Ontario where I live. Um, here in Ontario, um, we've conserved around 85,000 hectares of land across right across the province, mostly focused in these green areas. These green patches on the map are what we call natural areas, and we, we develop a pretty complex landscape scale conservation plan that guides which land guides us in, in deciding which land we want to acquire, what we want to do with it once we've acquired it, what kind of restoration we need to embark in, what kind of management we need to do, um, thinking in, about what kind of species are there, what kind of species are there already, what kind of species have been lost from there that we can start working to, to replace. And increasingly, we're, we're thinking about insects and pollinators as we're, we're making these plans. So zooming in any further, even further, what, what are we actually doing? Sure, we, we acquire a bunch of land, but what happens next? Um, so going back to all those threats I mentioned that pollinators are suffering from, we can't fix all of those things, unfortunately. I really want to wave a big magic wand and fix all of those things, but we can't address all of those threats directly. But by addressing some of the key threats, we can often reduce the relative impact of some of the other problems that are happening. Um, I don't think I mentioned this yet already, but we not only do we acquire land and, and protect it forever, but we actually take care of that land forever. We don't just buy it and walk away. We have a really active stewardship team, um, highly trained professionals that take care of those properties. We go out several times a year, many, many times a year in some cases, um, taking care of non-native invasive plants, conducting restoration work, in some cases, installing trails and things like that for visitors like yourselves to come and see these places. And in Southwestern Ontario alone, we've restored over 900 hectares of former agricultural land, which we bought. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of pollinator habitat. So this is a few pictures to show kind of what that looks like. In some cases, we, we have purchased land, which includes some agricultural land, like this tobacco field at the top in Southern Ontario. And over time, we will restore that land by planting native wildflowers, native grasses, trees in some cases, and providing habitat for cute bumblebee or cute bees, like this little sweat bee, I think it is. Um, and also nesting birds, snakes, mammals, all the full spectrum of wildlife that had been lost from those areas. So, that means that we spend a lot of time scrabbling around in ditches and along adjacent natural areas in our properties, collecting wildflower seeds um, and then scattering them onto the, the field once the, the farmer's lease is finished and once he's, he's harvested his final crop. We'll also plant acorns in cases where we're trying to restore forest. Um, so this is a bucket full of several different species of acorns um, in a restoration project I was helping with on Pelee Island a few years ago. Um, we also run volunteer events, so you can come out and give us a hand um, planting little plugs of native grasses in this case. Um, this is a really intensive hands-on approach to, to restoration, but in some cases it's a really good way to, to speed up restoration for, for wildlife really quickly so that we can get some plants established really fast. We also build wetlands on some of these sites, so um, it's easy to think about pollinators, bees and butterflies and, you know, happy, dry, sunny meadows, but actually forest ecosystems and wetland ecosystems are also really important for insects in general, including pollinators. So in cases where it's appropriate and, and safe for the neighbouring properties, of course, we will scoop out some hollows in these fields, plant wetland plants all around the edges, and lo and behold, attract um, cool waterfowl like this blue-winged teal and spotted sandpaper, sandpiper and turtles and frogs and all those fun things. But also a lot of um, wetland-dependent insects, including pollinators. So just a, a quick zoom in on a, a property that was restored just before I started working for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, this was a former tobacco field that we purchased and installed about 100 species of native wildflowers and, and grasses and trees and shrubs. And the first year it kind of looked a bit crappy. We weren't quite sure if it worked or not. It was kind of all one or two species coming up. But just a couple of years later, it's this beautiful, diverse, early successional oak savanna ecosystem. So you can see some young oak trees just springing up here. There's some wildflowers that you can see flowering. There's some tussocks of grass. 
And also importantly, there's some bare patches of sand. Um, so many of our bees and, and other, other insects actually need bare sand in which to nest. They'll, some insects will, will um, lay their eggs in sand, some will catch an, another insect that they will lay their eggs into and bury that insect so that when their eggs hatch, the, the babies have something to eat. So often bare patches of ground are at least as important as the plants that are growing all around them. And that's something that we've managed to recreate in some of our restoration sites. Um, and this particular site was studied by a, a student quite a few years ago now, and she actually documented over a hundred species of bee just I think two to three years after this tobacco farm was planted with our native wildflowers. So it's a really quite an impressive impact that you can have quite quickly and we're, 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 we're lucky here in southwestern Ontario that the growing seasons are quite long and quite intense and the native biodiversity is is incredible so we're able to support a lot of wildlife really quite quickly but these same principles apply all over the world um, there's you know insects are dependent on the plants that they they evolved with so the same same strategies are true elsewhere even when you have a much slower growing season so one of the things that we're thinking about, both in terms of supporting pollinators, but especially when we're thinking about supporting pollinators through climate change, is to really maximize plant diversity in, in, in a way that's in accordance with what would have been here naturally. So we're not trying to increase diversity beyond what would have occurred naturally, but looking at what occurs here in the landscape. We're trying to install as many of those species of plant as possible so that we can create as many different niches for all of these different insects as we possibly can. Um, so we'll develop very specific planting lists with a lot of input from experts, of course, and we'll use these lists to try and design in some ways a landscape that we want that we, we think will be appropriate for the area, but will also maximize the wildlife that we can support. And increasingly we're looking at installing as much as we can of very specific plants, like specific host plants. So for example, we have a project going right now where we're looking at reintroducing mottled dusky wing butterfly back in various parts of the province where they've been been extirpated and they they need a, a plant called New Jersey tea which happens to be a really fantastic plant to grow in your garden by the way um, but it's also a, a native small shrub that is part of the ecosystems where we're working so we're, we're making sure we're planting as much of that as possible in key areas with a view to being able to support that specific butterfly in the future Similarly, sundial lupin, like this, the, the plant in the photo here, is, is a really important plant for several butterflies, in fact, including mottle dusky wing. And of course, planting different species of milkweed to support monarch, monarch butterflies. But it's not over once we've planted. We, we, as we're thinking more and more about long-term management for specific species or specific groups of species, then we're making long-term management commitments to maintain the structure of these sites for the, for the animals that we want to support, but also the species diversity. And that can involve some, some pretty intensive and, and sometimes quite expensive hands-on work. So controlling non-native invasive plants, like I mentioned the lily of the valley in the, the earlier slides, but some of these sites do get invaded by a lot of non-native plants, which really don't support the same kind of insect diversity as these native species do. Um, in some cases, like this site in southern Norfolk, um, near Long Point in Ontario, we actually did a prescribed burn. So we, we burned this lovely site, which sounds like a horrific thing to do if you're not used to this concept. But actually fire is a really important part of many of the, our landscapes in, in Ontario and throughout North America and beyond. So regular, well-managed, carefully planned fires um, can kind of reset the clock a little bit in terms of the vegetation succession. Some of the plants actually need fire before their seeds will germinate. And again, you can see all these open patches of sand now that the, the fire has gone through. And those are really important for all of those ground nesting insects that I mentioned before. You can see all the green that's coming up. This is just a handful of weeks after we, we, we burned the site and the lupins are already flowering like crazy. This was just earlier this year. Um, and of course, we're not doing this alone. Um, a lot of this work is in partnership with many, many experts, and including in this particular case, the Ontario Species at Risk Butterfly Recovery Team, that we're, we're really grateful for all of the input we've received from them for our work. So um, that's all cool and exciting. And obviously, I've had a lot of satisfaction out of being involved with that. But maybe, or I hope that some of you are maybe like, hey, what can I do? Can I help? Can I do some of this too? 
Um, and if you're like me, then you're probably sad right now that you don't have a 200 acre field or, or more that you can restore in the way that we've done. Um, but you can still help if you want to. Um, you should consider planting some native plants, even if you just have a balcony or a tiny little patty or some small outdoor space that you, you, can, you can manage. Find a native plant. Um, there's many um, native plant nurseries where you can buy native plants now. You can even order them online starting this year. Um, plant something on a pot. Um, if you have a, a, a bigger garden with, with, with you know, some bigger planters or some just areas of soil, then, then always try and choose a few native plants that you can jam in the ground because they will genuinely support a lot more native insect biodiversity than anything, any non-native um, ornamental plants that you can buy. So I have a few, um, I could talk about native plant gardening all day, but that wasn't really what I was supposed to do today. Um, but I have a few quick examples of some well-behaved plants that are native to Southern Ontario that you might want to try in your garden. Um, if you're calling in from elsewhere for, for here, then for this talk, then I would encourage you to look up um, native plants in your region. There's lots of resources online. Um, iNaturalist is a great example of a place that you can go to find out if a plant is considered native or non-native, for example. Um, so yeah, if you're in Southern Ontario and you have a sunny dry spot, then prairie smoke or butterfly weed are both really awesome species that you can choose. Um, prairie smoke, I have a little patch on the edge of my drive that um, I basically shovel snow from my drive onto it all winter. And of course that snow is kind of salty and gritty and not very nice and shovel, shovel, shovel the whole winter. And then at the end of March, early April, as the snow is melting, then this amazing plant is already producing flowers for me. And it flowers for a chunk in the spring and then it produces these lovely fluffy seed heads later on in the summer. So it's a really cool plant. Um, butterfly weed, I'm including the scientific name here, not, not to kind of show off and look all clever, but because there's a lot of plants that are sold using the word butterfly in their common name. And many of them are not particularly useful for butterflies for their entire life cycle. This one species here in Ontario, and I think beyond in other parts of North America, is a plant that will support monarch butterflies. They will, not only will they drink nectar from the flowers, they'll also lay their eggs on it. So it will genuinely support butterflies in a useful manner. Um, and a quick note about that particular species. Um, this is my, one of my butterfly milkweeds that I have in my garden. And here in London, Ontario, it was a really dry year. And I don't water anything except my vegetables. And as you can see, I do not water my lawn. And I also did not water that butterfly milkweed in the background. So it produced these luscious green leaves and all of these incredible flowers without me doing anything whatsoever. I just jammed a plant in the ground about 10 years ago and it does this for me every year, despite me completely ignoring it. So if you're a bit of a lazy gardener like I can be, or you would aspire to become a lazy gardener, then native plants are really are the way to go as well, just in case you needed another reason. Um, if you have a bunch of shade in your garden, then of course there's a huge selection of native plants that grow in the shade as well that support pollinators. So blue stem goldenrod, um, if you remember from probably my very first or second slide, this has big showy brightly colored flowers, which means it's actually dependent on insects to pollinate it. My um, blue stem goldenrods were just covered in a whole range of native bees the other day. Um, it's unlikely to make you sneeze. The pollen is heavy and sticky and is designed to hitch, hitch a ride on a bee rather than float into your nostrils. Uh, wild columbine is another fabulous plant. Um, not only will it attract bees, but it will also attract hummingbirds here in Ontario. So that's a pretty neat plant. And if you have a bunch and a, a cluster like this, then you can make really quite a nice display. It's, it can be quite spectacular. Um, and here in Ontario and at, at many other parts of the world, the, the diversity of native plants all around you is actually surprisingly high. And you can jam a lot of different species into quite a small area. Um, this is my front yard a few years ago, back when it was actually somewhat tidy. Um, and I've been able to jam 20 or 30 native plants right into a very, very small area. Um, and I've actually dug out some ponds and captured the water from the downspout from my house. So I built a little wetland system so I can actually support both wetland plants and dry upland plants 
adjacent. And that's something that's actually fairly straightforward to do. If you, if you have a house with a dance spout, then you can actually divert the water or some of the water and create a little wet spot. And as long as it's you know, not then pouring into the foundation of your house or your neighbor's house, then you can use that cleverly to grow some, some even more diversity of plants and support even more cool pollinators. Um, so just some more arbitrary pretty pictures of, of nice um, native Ontario plants, all of which support pollinators and are all easy to grow without any maintenance whatsoever. Um, and the last point I'll leave you with is to absolutely not forget about winter. Um, here in Ontario right now, the leaves are tumbling off the trees onto the road, onto your lawn, onto your driveway. Um, and it's very tempting. I know many of you spend a lot of time raking up the leaves and shoving them in bags and putting them out in the street for the city to pick up or you send them off to landfill or whatever. But actually those dead, dead leaves and stems and things are incredibly important habitat for, for all of our insects. Um, there's many really beautiful um, butterflies and moths that actually spend the winter in leaf litter as, as cocoons or as larvae. Um, and by raking up the leaves and sending them off to the landfill or to the, the, the composter, then those insects are lost from your garden and, and often killed. So if you have any areas that you can kind of rake stuff out of the way into a pile, then you'll be providing a lot of habitat for, for cool overwintering insects, including some bees and, and other pollinating insects. Um, it'll provide food for all sorts of birds. There's lots of birds migrating south right now that are, are coming through your yard looking for places to, to forage. And some of the seeds and, and in fact some of those insects, in fact, um, are actually quite important for those migratory birds. And, and many of these wintering, you know, the, the seed heads and things are actually really pretty to look at. So leave them standing for a bit longer, enjoy their, their shapes and colors and, and enjoy the wildlife that comes to use them. I think that's me finished. So I would be happy to take any questions um, either now or if you want to email me or look me up on online afterwards, then I hope you've enjoyed this and look forward to, to hearing your thoughts. Awesome. Thank you very much, Barry. That's you covered everything from the importance of pollinators and our native species through to how to help them on your own you know, front lawn. Um, and everything in, in between. So people, if you have questions, uh, please add them to the chat box. Um, just bear with me for one minute. I'm just gonna switch back to my screen. So we had a couple of questions coming already, but so I just wanna, again, put a plug in for our sponsors. We always wanna thank uh, the people who are able to make this possible. Um, so if you had opportunity to visit these places or um, give them a shout out online, we encourage you to do so. Um, so very, the first question was back from the very beginning, um, we talked about pollinator declines in different groups besides just bees potentially declining. Um, one question was, um, can you refer to some more specific examples of problems related to the decline of native pollinator guilds? So some of these different guilds are declining. Is there any problems, specific examples that you can foresee of us losing different types of bees or beetles or anything? Right, um, so, so as, as I mentioned quite early on, but didn't go into detail, a lot of the food that we eat is actually dependent on wild native pollinators to pollinate it. So although we, we use um, domestic honeybees to pollinate a lot of our crops, even those crops are also helped out, helped along the pollination route with native um, pollinators also come in and pollinate some of those crops. So if domestic honeybees continue to suffer problems and we lose even more of our native pollinators, then our food is going to start costing a lot more money because you're gonna to have to have people out there hand pollinating flowers in order to produce things like apples and, and the other fruit that we need. Um, now, I don't have any actual numbers on that. That's not quite my field of expertise. But um, if you do a little bit of Googling about um, pollinator decline and food security, then you'll probably find a lot of information there. Um, I'm not sure that anyone's actually detected differences in wild plants yet, but it's really hard to study that kind of thing. Um, but there has been there have been a lot of studies around the world showing really marked declines in insects in general um, and including pollinators. And that we think is being reflected in, in precipitous declines in many birds throughout the world, um, including North America and Europe. Um, I'm not sure if we've detected um, 
declines in in seed production or fruit production in wild plants. But as I say, that's pretty hard to to measure. Um, hope that helps. Perfect. Uh, the next question was, are there any urban initiatives that NCC is undertaking in terms of acquiring land? So often you're going great examples of that 200 acre land in the rural areas, but anything in the urban situation? Yeah, it's a great question. Traditionally in Ontario, we haven't done that much work in urban centers, um, partly because our, our we're looking at kind of bigger um, bigger kind of landscape scale approaches to conservation. We're trying to acquire kind of chunks of land and connect up existing protected areas that might be protected by other organizations um, and make some big chunks of, of land because many of the animals that are declining all around us are, are actually needing big chunks of habitat rather than just little pieces, which tends to be what you find in urban areas. Um, having said that, we do have a few properties that you're, you're welcome to visit right here in, in Ontario and urban areas. There's a property in the village of Font Hill, for example, in the Niagara area, where we've done over the years a chunk of um, invasive species control, um, a bunch of restoration work as well. So um, from time to time, we, we do have some, some urban sites, but partly because of the pressures that those types of properties receive, they require a lot more in the way of staffing to, to manage them to make sure it stays safe for our visitors and also that it stays safe for the wildlife that we're setting out to conserve. So we we have to think very carefully about taking on an urban property, I guess is the short answer. Okay, the next question relates both to urban properties as well as more rural one. Um, we see different conservation areas, parks, natural areas in general being kind of overrun with invasive species. Uh, these, these even have impacts as to be having, you know, goldfinches and kinglets being stuck in teas and burdocks and being killed. Um, what is NCC doing in terms of removing those invasive species? And also the question that was actually asked was, um, how is NCC educating people about these invasive species? And can NCC, you know, send out information, encourage people to remove invasive species? Right, yeah, the, there's a lot of questions in there. Um, so on Nature Conservancy of Canada properties um, here in Ontario, we once we've acquired the property, we produce a property management plan and that gives us a five-year plan of all of the things that we need to do there. Um, and that includes a, a big emphasis on invasive species control, um, sadly enough, because it's an issue as you pointed out. Um, so every five years we update those plans. So we're always revisiting what we've achieved, what we still have to do and how much more money we need to raise to continue that stewardship work. Um, so we, we, we use those plans to make sure that our work is very strategic. So we will start with the, the nastiest invasives first. So things like Phrygmites, that's a, an important invader in wetland habitat, for example. We have some really big projects trying to deal with that at a landscape scale in southern Ontario. Um, things like garlic mustard in the forest, we're dealing with that everywhere. Um, autumn olive is an invasive shrub on some of these um, more open grassland and restored areas. Um, so we just try to set, set out um, to do it strategically. We, we might start in the western edge and sweep east and try and deal with them all and then a couple of years later we'll come back and sweep back through again. Um, but unfortunately it is a, a ongoing project. It is not a never-ending task but it, it, it can feel like it sometimes. So um, and yeah it's hard to keep on top of and, and that's why I think someone pointed out that they see a lot of invasive species in many conservation areas and that's simply reflective of, of how much time and energy and money it can take to actually manage these things properly and repeatedly over time. Um, in terms of outreach and education about it, um, we will we do um, produce some brochures and some um, do public talks like this, um, especially in areas where we're focusing on, on a very specific invasive species problem or something like that. And we also partner with other organizations that do that work too. So um, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, for example, has a lot of really great information on their website um, about non-native invasive species and what you can do to control them. So that would be a good resource I would suggest you, you look up. And if anyone has specific questions about an invasive species they're trying to tackle, then feel free to reach out to me and I can um, try and point you at some very specific resources if that's helpful. Perfect. Thanks, Barry. That was a, yes, a very long question. Uh, next question is related to climate change and planting and choosing the plants we want. Um, some people are recommending we plant for a zone further south than we currently are. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on designing your garden with climate change in mind? Yeah, it's a great question and one that, that we're toying with a lot in, in the conservation world. Um, here in southern Ontario, I tend to be of the mindset that there is so much incredible diversity that's already that has already been lost in terms of plants. Like most of the plants in my garden in London, I have around 200 native plants in my garden and I've actually never seen most of them in the wild, um, which is part of the reflection of me not having been out and about botanizing enough, but it's also a reflection on, on how relatively uncommon what used to be common native plants actually are. Um, so I think we can do a lot with the diversity that we have right here. And many of our planting lists on our restored sites, they're kind of one, 200 species strong in some cases. Um, and I think with that kind of diversity, then we're providing a lot of resilience um, with, you know, to deal with climate change. There's certainly some key plants, um, often some species at risk plants that may not be able to move north by themselves with climate change that would probably warrant some specific attention and, and transplanting further north. But here in the Great Lakes region, the other factor is that, that it's not quite as simple as things just moving north. The Great Lakes have a really big impact on our local climate here. Um, so there's a bunch of north-south stuff, but there's probably a bunch of east-west stuff happening as well. And it's not just about temperature either, it's about changes in precipitation and changes in the, the pattern of, of weather events as well. So I, I guess the short answer is it's pretty complicated and I think we have a long way to go with just restoring the habitats that we've lost before we necessarily start need to mess, mess around too much with moving stuff significantly out of range. Um, hopefully that was a reasonably followable, somewhat cop-out answer. <laughs> Yes, the conservation field's equally divided as to whether to plant um, plant for the south or not, or what to what to do. So it is something people should research and sort of come up with the, their own own ideas. The next question relates to bumblebees and pollinators, and looking at the impact that commercial managed bees like bumblebees have on our native pollinators. Um, the example given is that there's concern about lab bred or commercially bred bumblebees from Ontario coming into maritime greenhouses. And the individual's wondering if you have any idea, <laughs> excuse me, what impact um, those bees might have on the native pollinators or pollinators in general due to managed um, mm -hmm. bumblebees. Yeah, it's a great question. I'll say first out that I, I am not an entomologist and I'm not a, a bee specialist either. So I'm not the right, I, I don't have the expertise to answer that properly. Um, but in general terms, um, when we have a, a, a big, um, what am I, what's the word, like a big um, domesticated population of any kind of animal, and if that population then spreads into wild areas or into areas where it, it didn't occur naturally, then there's always risks associated with that. There's risks of disease transmission, parasite transmission, there's risks of competition with native, native animals and things like that. So. Um, the, the, the um, domestic honeybee situation is pretty well managed, it's regulated, it's, you know, it's a domestic animal like a cow or a sheep or a horse, so there are um, regulations and guidelines associated with that. And I, I you know, I, as I say, I don't know much about that field, but th there will be um, balances in check to try to manage some of those things. But one thing we see in the, the, the wild is that when honeybees occur in cohort with native bees that honeybees can be a bit more um, dominant. They can compete with native bees and other pollinators for um, pollen and nectar resources. Sometimes they can actually rob nectar from flowers without conducting pollination. So they can kind of puncture the flower further down and avoid being touched by the pollen and don't move the pollen around. And in the case of a native plant, that's a huge problem because you've just lost all of your nectar reward without being pollinated. So you're not gonna be able to produce pollen or produce seeds, sorry. So there are issues like that that have been documented with, with honeybees in relation to native bees in, in parts of North America. I guess I am a bumblebee researcher, so I can jump in on that question. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, actually it's a big concern, but you think the managed bumblebees might be one of the main threats um, to our health of our native bees and maybe what's causing some of the declines. Um, because yes, the bees don't stay in the greenhouses where they're quote unquote supposed to, and they do go outside. And even in some cases, bumblebees are put out into the fields 
uh, for some say strawberries for open pollination anyways, not inside a greenhouse. So um, it is a concern. There is disease transmission that's been documented um, from the managed bees to the wild bees. So I'm not as aware of the genetics um, impact on the wild bees, but I'm sure it's happening. We've documented proof of them breeding outside of, you know, captivity, quote unquote. So it's an interesting field to look into in to more. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, just for a general question, there's an individual who's working the city of Kitchener to try to create habitat. Um, she wants to know if it's possible to connect to get specific advice as to what to plant in these areas. Sure, yeah. Um, I think my email address was on my last slide, but if you can, maybe Victoria, if you're able to connect us electronically, then I'd be happy to, to come up with some ideas and also connect you with other people that, that have more expertise than I do. Sure. Uh, another question with more of a comment is saying in the Hamilton Burlington area of Ontario is an initiative called the Coots to Escarpment Eco Park. And the goal is to establish contigu contiguous natural areas between the head of Lake Ontario up to the surrounding escarpment areas. So this is a way, potentially with climate change as well, that things can move uh, north to south. And it's a neat, mm -hmm. neat initiative, something we should be documenting more of. Um, I guess I'll add a question onto that though, uh, Barry. Um, is NCC looking at connections, like network connections and landscape corridors when you're doing your land um, agreements and purchasing? Absolutely. And, and it's always really neat to hear about examples like the one you just mentioned, because, you know, NCC is, is, is pretty big and we're doing cool things, but there's only so much we can do alone. So all of these more local initiatives, especially in and around urban areas, are, are actually always really pleasing to hear about because it, it kind of it amplifies the impact of our work and, and vice versa. So keep it up, I guess I would, I would say. Um, and yeah, for sure, we, we're looking at both local scale, you know, what do we need to plant to support this one insect? But we're also looking at, well, how much of it do we need to plant and how much of that habitat structure do we need to plant in order to support, say, grassland birds or forest birds or whatever it is. So we're looking at basically every scale simultaneously to some extent, which is, you know, what keeps me on my toes is thinking about, as I say, everything from host plants to landscape scale ecology, trying to connect connect things for migratory birds and insects and bats and um, in the north, looking at how how we can best connect large areas for for large wide wide ranging mammals as well. So, so yeah, the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, so next question is: um, Some of the individuals are planting white clover into the lawns to try to replace the sort of normal fescue grasses. Is that the best option for lawns for pollinators, particularly when you don't have much lawn? Um, right. Is this helpful? Yeah, so I would say in the context of a lawn, then something that produces a flower that supports pollinators is better than something that doesn't. So it's all it's all relative, you know, lawn is better than concrete, but native plants are better than lawn. <laughs> um, so, you know, I have some lawn as well, as you saw in my photo, I, I don't invest in it at all. I don't water it, I don't fertilize it, I don't do any of that stuff. I use it as a basically a trail to get to the interesting parts of my garden. Um, so if you're able to jam in a bunch of native plants around the edge or, or make it even smaller and plant actual native plants, then, then that would be better. But certainly having some flowers in the lawn, in the areas that you need to keep as lawn, um, is certainly better than keeping it as, as pretty much sterile, usually non-native grass lawn. Perfect, thanks. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Add them to the chat box on the bottom. Um, we still have a couple more minutes left if everyone has questions. Well, I guess there's no more questions. Um, let me just give people another 30 seconds to jump in in case they do have questions. Oh, yes, there's a question um, earlier about, are you aware of any research on the impacts of the 5G network on pollinators? Just like they used to discuss all like cell phone towers affecting pollinators. Oh, um, no, I'm not. Yeah, um, most, most of the research on um, cell phone towers show there's no impact on pollinators. I'm not sure about any impact on terrestrial wildlife at all. I haven't seen any studies, but I'm not aware of it being a, an issue. Yeah, and in fact, some, some um, installations of, of things like cell phone towers, solar panels, wind turbines, those kind of things that, that often cause 
because many people some disquiet it can actually represent quite a neat opportunity to get some native plants jammed into a landscape that otherwise wouldn't have supported any so many of these things are being installed in agricultural areas for example or in areas that are are kind of semi semi derelict or, or, or not particularly natural so there's opportunities to partner with the organizations that construct these things to, to restore the footprint around them to, to put in some pollinator habitat. So I think there's neat opportunities like that that, that have yet to be realized across the landscape that um, could actually be a net gain. Yeah, rights away, whether it's, you know, electrical lines or gas lines, you all have a um, potential, right? It's habitat connectivity. Um, especially some of the early on the telephone lines, um, it's they keep it as like meadow rather than forest. And sometimes it's a different habitat as well for pollinators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we have some opportunities um, in central Ontario where there's some quite large hydro corridors through areas that are partly forested and partly tall grass habitat, and you know one can argue it's a real shame there's a giant hydro thing through the middle of a landscape, but actually it's a really cool opportunity to have a what happens to be a rather linear prairie habitat. So um, I think it's, it's a question of acknowledging what we need in our landscape and, and how we can how we can reduce the impacts of that. And thinking about native plants all of the time provides that opportunity, I would say. Exactly. Um, any last questions? Two minutes left. Well, if not, um, thank you everyone for coming in. We had, I think, about 42 people joining us live, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more uh, watching this later on YouTube. Uh, again, a reminder to sign up for the next four talks in our speaker series over the next month, um, Tuesday mornings and or Thursday, Tuesday evenings and or Thursdays. Basically check the schedule online for the, for the actual dates and times of the talks. A uh, big thank you to all our sponsors, and again, a big thank you to Vary for coming out today. Um, to join us live despite the delays from back in March when we made this happen and there's really excellent talk. So thank you very much, Barry, and thank you everyone else for coming. Thanks for having me.